Good morning. How are you guys? You sound a little more awake than first service, <laughs> but that's how it always is, right? You're all in here first service, like, where's my latte? Well, it's really awesome to be here with you guys. I have a special place in my heart for Calvary Chapels. While I've never been actually a member of a Calvary Chapel, I did grow up in the church and Calvary Chapel leadership and pastors from various churches around Orange County and Southern California have poured into me in significant ways through my walk with the Lord over the last decade or so. And so Calvary Chapel has a close place in my heart and I have such respect for your leadership here and your pastors who don't shy away from preaching the full counsel of God, even when it may be inconvenient for their reputation. So why don't you go ahead and give your, uh, yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> By the way, your pastors asked me to say that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They didn't. But I would have if they had, because I, I believe in it. And it's a real pleasure and honor to be here with you. I want to start with just a couple opening comments. I'm not going to assume that every single person here this morning identifies as pro-life. I think it's safe to say most of you are. But I'm not going to assume everyone is. And so if you identify as pro-choice, meaning you believe a woman should have the legal right to have an abortion, or if you identify as personally pro-life, the idea that you wouldn't get an abortion and you kind of think it's bad, but you think it should remain legally protected, then I would invite you to engage with me with an open mind. I'm not here to demonize anyone that believes differently than me. And because I believe in the intrinsic dignity and value of all human beings, I believe that those who disagree with me have that same value. So if you do not hold what would be described as the pro-life position, but you are a follower of Jesus, I would ask you to pray right now to the Lord and ask if there's anything specifically that the Holy Spirit would want to teach you. And put that prayer before the Lord and see if he'll answer it. Not because I have anything phenomenal to tell you, but asking the Holy Spirit if there's something he wants to teach you. A friend of mine, Dr. Mike Adams, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, a Christian and an outspoken pro-life advocate, earlier this year debated an abortionist in a public forum on the moral question of abortion. Is abortion a moral right or a moral wrong? And the name of this abortionist is Dr. Willie Parker. Dr. Willie Parker is an interesting man, to put it lightly. You see, Dr. Willie Parker describes himself as a Christian abortionist. And he wrote a 2015 New York Times opinion editorial called Why I Provide Abortions. Here's a segment of what he said. The Good Samaritan, in the parable, reversed the question of concern to care more about the well-being of the person needing help than about what might happen to him for stopping to give help. I realized that if I were to show compassion, I would have to act on behalf of those women. My concern about women who lacked access to abortion became more important to me than worrying about what might happen to me for providing those services. So according to Dr. Willie Parker, the Christian abortionist, abortionists are just like the Good Samaritan because they show compassion and love to people needing help course, except the unborn children who they slowly dismember. But otherwise, they show compassion and care to people who need help. This is some deep spiritual confusion. And my friends, this confusion has seeped into the church. Not necessarily this church. This is a very pro-life church. But in the capital C church, this confusion is in the church. There is a growing number of people who identify as Christian and pro-choice. It's just like saying you're a Christian, but you support the legality of slavery. In response to this type of spiritual confusion, friends, we as Christians need grace and truth and love and light. And we need the real Jesus to show us how to engage on this issue by being a voice for the unborn and by bringing grace and truth. We cannot sacrifice truth on the altar of grace or grace on the altar of truth. We need both. So I'm actually going to start this talk and our conversation together with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And rather than finding some strange spiritual justification to pursue a career as an abortionist, I think we're going to find a very different message from the creator of the universe who came down in bodily form as Jesus Christ. 
And the parable of the Good Samaritan is very important for our conversation this morning on abortion. Because the parable of the Good Samaritan reminds us of God's most important commandments, but also our utter failure to obey those commandments. And you know this parable, right? So a lawyer stands up and he puts Jesus to the test and he firstly says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's an important question. How do I get to heaven? How do I get eternal life? And Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He said, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Nailed it. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? In response to the question, how do I get to heaven? And who is my neighbor? Jesus chooses to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan. Those are two very big questions. And those are questions that we need to answer together. So he tells this parable. You know it. A man's traveling on the road. He's beaten. He's mugged. He's robbed. He's left for dead. As he's sitting on the side of the road, bleeding out, two different religious men walk by, don't they? A Levite and a priest. Men who, like the lawyer, would have answered correctly by saying, I know the law of God. I'm a religious leader. I know the law of God. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbors yourself. And when they had the opportunity to love a neighbor who was bleeding, they walked by on the other side of the road. I see you, but I don't see you. I don't want to love you. You're inconvenient to love. It was the good Samaritan, the bleeding victim's natural enemy, because remember, Jews and Samaritans hated one another. Who Luke's gospel says, when he saw the man, he had compassion. He showed compassion, didn't he? His faith evidenced itself in works. He went and he bandaged the man's wounds. He poured on oil and wine. He put the man on his own donkey, so he had to walk. He took him to the nearest inn. He cared for him more. Then he told the innkeeper, I got to go. But when I come back, I'm going to pay you for any other costs that accumulated in caring for this man while I was gone. Radical sacrifices, friends of his time, his energy, and his money to love his neighbor, a bleeding neighbor, a bleeding victim, culturally defined as his enemy. So this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is a story Jesus chooses to tell in response to the question, what must I do to get eternal life, and who is my neighbor? So does this lawyer ask who is my neighbor because he just really wants to make sure he doesn't leave anyone out of the definition of neighbor? Right? That's why, right? He just, he's just such a self-righteous, loving dude. He's like, Jesus, I just want to love people really good. Can you tell me who my neighbor is so I, I, so I don't leave anyone out of the definition of neighbor? No. He wants to figure out who he can still hate and get into heaven. He only asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor, in order to figure out who isn't his neighbor. The lawyer wanted to define some people as neighbors and some people as non-neighbors so he could shirk himself of the responsibility of loving those that were inconvenient to love and those that he didn't want to love. And Jesus, in his brilliance, friends, switches the question from who is my neighbor to are you a good neighbor? Am I a good neighbor? Friends, the answer to that question should humble all of us. Because the standard of love that Jesus lays out in the Good Samaritan, in fact, in Scripture, is a standard that is indeed impossible to achieve. <laughs> Perfect love for an enemy. And you know the standard of love that Jesus requires, don't you? You know what is expected and demanded of us as Christians. Jesus says in Matthew 5.43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ah, oh, man. Not easy. Jesus raises the bar again in John 13, 34 and says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another that are easy to love? No. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Oh, man, Lord. Because if you ask yourself the question, how did Jesus love us? That answer is to the grave, to the cross to the wrath of God. And then he says, as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Who loves like that all the time? Do we even love our families like that all the time? Any wives want to vouch for their perfectly loving, consistent husbands? Or vice versa? 
Now, I didn't think so. No one's married to Jesus, right? <laughs> much less our enemies, much less those that persecute us, much less those that we feel like we want to hate and that are inconvenient to love. Remember, Jews and Samaritans hated one another. So this is an example of someone loving an enemy that would have been easy for him to be happy to see him bleeding out. Yes, that's my enemy! Finally, justice, and he loves him with his time, energy, and money. Friends, we have all been like the Levite and the priest. Too often, we've walked by neighbors who needed our help and done nothing about it. On the issue of abortion, we've all been like the Levite and the priest. We've known that there were bleeding victims, and we've done this. We knew they were being killed, but we pretended like we didn't see them. So friends, applied to the topic of abortion this morning, the parable of the Good Samaritan is bad news for everyone. For all of us. Because whether you've had an abortion or not, no one in this church, indeed no one anywhere on the planet, loves their neighbor the way that the law of God commands. None of us can meet that standard of holiness. Mother Teresa fails that test. The best pro-life advocate you know fails that test. The local pregnancy resource center director fails that test. I fail that test and you fail that test. In short, we are not righteous and we need an alien righteousness that Jesus freely provides to his people. So this is important, friends, because I'm not here to pass blame on you this morning. I'm not here to blame abortion on the church and tell you that you failed and you're not doing enough. I'm here as someone who has also regularly failed to love my neighbor, regularly failed to love my unborn neighbor. The playing field is level before the cross. We have all failed to love the way that Jesus requires. So what's the good news? This is bad news, right? What the heck do we do? Jesus is the greater good Samaritan. We are either the Levite and the priest, avoiding bleeding victims, or we're the lawyer trying to create definitions of neighbor and definitions of non-neighbor so we can conveniently apply the definition of non-neighbor to people we don't like. We're not the Good Samaritan. Jesus is the greater Good Samaritan. He's the one that comes to us while we're bleeding out on the side of the road in our own sin and muck and loves us to the uttermost if we just repent and accept his freely given grace. 1 John 4.10, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to give us an alien righteousness, to fulfill the standard of perfect love that we couldn't, and then apply that to us. This is the good news. So we respond to this by loving others. 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So I want you to hear my heart. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and just will yourself to have a more perfect love. Come on, just love people better. Get the gospel. Get it in your head and love people better. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that our response to the gospel and what Jesus has done for us ought to naturally manifest itself by seeking to love our unborn neighbors and their mothers and fathers and seeking to save them from death as those who have been saved from eternal death. That's what I'm saying. Our motivation to love our unborn neighbor is not to earn God's love. We do it because we already have it. So what does this mean for us on the issue of abortion? The playing field's level. We've all failed to love our unborn neighbors appropriately. How do we bring love and truth and grace and light to the issue of abortion as image bearers of God who are told to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves? Well, I think the answer is simple. I think the answer is we need to love our unborn neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourself. The second greatest commandment is the unborn our neighbor. This is very important because just like the lawyer in the parable of the Good Samaritan wanted to define some people as non-neighbors, and some people as neighbors. Friends, the unborn children in our midst are regularly defined by the culture as non-neighbors, non-persons, non-humans, clumps of insensate tissue for which abortion gently suctions out the contents of the womb. They're defined as non-neighbors. Because if you can create a class of human beings and deny them personhood, deny them humanity, it becomes easier to justify their extermination. So we call abortion reproductive health care, feminism, and women's rights because we do not see them and treat them as neighbors. And friends, society has such a bloody history of defining people out of existence in order to justify their mass extermination. 
This is not new. I'm thinking the Holocaust and slavery. Nazis and racists who said that those Jews and those blacks are, okay, they're human beings, but they're not persons. And because they're not persons, we can treat them however we want. This is a very dangerous ideology. And now it's being applied to unborn children, friends, for 47 years of legalized killing in the United States of America. So maybe you don't think that the title neighbor ap appropriately applies to the unborn. Maybe you hold a different position. Maybe when you hear the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, you don't think that applies to the unborn. Or maybe you think it does, but you've never known how to defend that in the secular culture to your pro-choice friends, family members, and coworkers who don't share your Christian worldview. So together, let's examine who the unborn is. Let's see, let's see who they are. Let's see if they are our neighbors and our persons or not. And if they are, how we can defend that position with grace and truth in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, friends, there's only one question we have to answer to determine if the unborn is our neighbor, if they're a person, or if they're just a blob of tissue that you can suction out of the uterus. Only one question we have to answer. You've been told that the abortion issue is what? Deeply complex, right? Deeply complex. It's very simple. And there's only one question we have to answer to bring simplicity and clarity to the issue of abortion. This will equip you to defend life. So to tell you what that one question is, I want you to imagine for a second that you're standing at your kitchen sink cleaning dishes one evening, okay? By hand, unfortunately, because God hasn't blessed you with the dishwasher. So as you're standing there cleaning your dishes, God forbid, your three-year-old toddler walks up behind you. Your back is turned, and you hear your toddler say, Mommy or Daddy, can I kill this? Now, what's going to be the first question out of your mouth in response to that question? What is it? Kill what? Exactly. Because if you turn around and he's holding a cockroach, dad might say, here, son, here's a hammer. Have fun. Don't tell mom. But if he's holding the newborn neighbor kitty, you might have a different response, unless you hate cats, in which case, no judgment. But if he's holding his little sister by the throat, you need counseling, friends. So you couldn't answer the question, can I kill this, until you answered the question, what is it? What's he got? Kill what, for goodness sakes? We cannot answer the question, can we kill the unborn? Because everyone agrees abortion kills something. Until we first answer the question, what is the unborn? Do you see how central that question is? As Greg Kokel, a Christian apologist, says, if the unborn are not human, no justification for abortion is necessary. You don't need to justify your abortion if the thing being aborted is not a human. In that case, abortion is no different than clipping your fingernails. But then he says, however, if the unborn are human, no justification for abortion is adequate. No justification in defense of the dismemberment of your baby in the womb suffices to defend that choice if the thing being aborted is a human being like you and I. What is the unborn indeed? That is the central question. Additionally, if the unborn is a human being, then the unborn is our neighbor. Because scripture teaches that all human beings are our neighbors. So what is the unborn? Let's answer that question. Because this is a question that the larger culture is going to avoid like wildfire. Because as it turns out, the answer is not very conducive to maintaining the pro-choice position. So what is the unborn? I'm going to answer this question this morning, friends, in three ways. I'm going to answer it scientifically. I'm going to answer it theologically. And I'm going to answer it philosophically. We're going to start with science because, as it turns out, science is a pretty good objective measure to determine if you're a biological human. <laughs> and the pro-choice movement always claims to be pro-science. So let's meet them where they're at and use the things that they claim to use to defend abortion and see where it leads us. So notice, I'm not going to the Bible, I'm not going to partisan politics to answer the question, what is the unborn? I'm just going to science, because it's something that those who disagree on this issue can agree to meet in the middle on. What does science teach us? According to the science of embryology, friends, which is simply the study of human beings before birth, that's the biology of unborn humans, the science of embryology teaches us that from the earliest stages of development, and that means conception, the unborn child is a distinct, living, and whole whole human being. I didn't come up with these terms. You'll find these in any embryology textbook on any university campus. <laughs> Distinct living and whole, unless those universities have banned truth, which is more common. 
distinct, living, and whole. These are the words to describe human beings from the moment of conception. And even abortion advocates admit that the unborn is a human from the moment of conception because the science is clear. Now, what do these terms mean? Well, distinct means separate, doesn't it? Distinct means unique. Distinct means you're not me and I'm not you. You're a distinct human being. The unborn is a distinct human being. But what's the mantra that you hear from defenders of abortion? My body, my choice. That argument assumes that how many bodies are involved? One. Is that true? Well, according to the science of embryology, if you care about objectivity, if you care about facts, if you care about truth, regardless of where that truth leads you, then you have to say that the body in your body is not your body. And because abortion always kills something, why aren't all women dead after abortions? Because the body that was dismembered was not hers. So the unborn child is indeed distinct. By the way, if unborn children are part of their mother's bodies, we have to accept some very strange intellectual conclusions, such as that pregnant women must have 20 fingers and 20 toes, two brains, two hearts, two different DNA codes, potentially two different blood types, and if she's pregnant with a boy, pregnant women now have male genitalia. <laughs> Figure that one out. Because you laugh, we have to accept the premise that they are not part of their mother's bodies, they're distinct. And they're living because, guess what? Dead things don't grow. And the unborn child meets all of the requirements for a living thing. So I have a near two-year-old. His name's Cedar Justice, much stronger name than mine. So I watch my wife be pregnant. Here's something that never happened. My wife never woke me up in the middle of the night shaking me, saying, Seth, wake up, wake up, wake up. Remind baby to grow. Come here, whisper to my uterus, remind him to grow. The reason why that didn't happen to any of you either is because parents do not will their unborn children to grow. They develop themselves from within. So they're living. Distinct living and whole, W-H-O-L-E. Do not confuse being a whole human being with being a developed human being. These are entirely different because we're always developing, correct? But being a whole human being simply means that you have everything you need to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. Here's what I mean by this. I'm 28, I'm not 40. Do I have everything I need to realize a 40-year-old's level of development? Yeah, I'm not lacking DNA, I'm not lacking a limb, right? Like, I'm gonna get to 40. Unless someone kills me, unless someone dismembers me and calls it reproductive health care. So the unborn child has everything they need from the moment of conception to realize their full growth and development as one of us, unless someone kills them. So we're always developing. They say men don't reach their mental peak until their 40s, which was very good news for my wife recently. <laughs> so you see, I'm still developing, aren't I? Do I have less of a right to life than those of you over 40 because I'm less developed? No, because we have everything we need to realize our full growth and development, even if we're at different levels of development than other people. Just like the unborn child has everything they need to realize their full growth and development, even if they're at an earlier stage of development than you and I. Distinct living and whole. This is what the science of embryology teaches us. So what is the unborn? They're a human being. The baby is a baby. Shocker. Living things only reproduce after their own kind. So male fathers and female mothers can only produce, wait, human beings. This is what the science teaches us. So the unborn is a human being, plain and simple. This is undisputed scientific objectivity. Now let's answer the question theologically. What is the unborn from the Bible? Theologically as Christians. And this is important because... There is a growing number of self-proclaimed Christians in America that identify as pro-choice. So we need to be able to reach them in a gracious and loving way as well. And we can do that by looking at what the theological case is. Because if you're a Christian, you have to believe in the authority of Scripture. If you believe in the authority of Scripture, you have to follow where the facts lead. So what does the Bible teach about the unborn? As beautiful, as many beautiful pro-life verses as there are, I'm actually not going to turn to any of those pro-life verses because abortion is wrong regardless of whether the Bible condemns it or not. There's plenty of things that the Bible doesn't condemn, right? Does it mean it condones it? No, because abortion is wrong whether the Bible says it's wrong or not. So let's just see what the Bible says about killing human beings and what gives human beings value. Well, we can start at the beginning of the human story. Genesis 1.26 says, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In the image of God. This is called the Imago Dei. So the same God that breathed out the Milky Way and dropped oceans breathed life into you. 
So you have intrinsic dignity, value, and worth in virtue of being a human being created by the creator of the universe. This is what the Bible teaches about human value. So, the Bible teaches that human beings are created in the image of God. And what did we just learn from the science of embryology? That unborn children are humans. So if all human beings are created in the image of God and the unborn child is a human being, then the unborn child bears the image of God. So the prohibitions against the shedding of innocent blood in scripture would apply equally to the unborn, would apply equally to abortion. Because the Bible strictly forbids the shedding of innocent blood. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Don't shed innocent blood. Proverbs says that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. What is abortion but the shedding of innocent blood of a human being in their mother's womb located six inches away? So when the Bible says don't kill the innocent, don't shed innocent blood, guess what? Those commandments would apply to abortion as well because abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. So what is the unborn? According to science, they're human beings. According to the Bible, they're image bearers of God and therefore it is wrong to kill them. Now, what is the unborn philosophically? This is really important, friends, and I want you to catch this more than anything else I say this morning because there are a massive group of people in our country who would agree with the science. They would literally sit here and go, he's right, unborn children are humans. I'd be a fool to say that that's not the case. They are biologically human. But we still need abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy and your tax dollars should fund it. What? How can you admit that the baby's a baby the unborn is a human, and still say it's okay to kill baby humans. The way that they're going to justify their position, friends, is by separating the term human from person. By saying that unborn children are human, but they're not persons. And because they don't meet the criteria checkbox that I as a pro-choicer have constructed to, to grant human value, therefore they're not persons and I can kill them. Friends, every time a society has separated the term human from person, disastrous consequences have followed. Namely, millions of dead innocent people. That's exactly what Nazis and racists did to Jews and blacks. They said that they were humans, but they weren't persons. The German Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court both said that the term person did not apply to Jews and blacks. When you dehumanize an entire class of human beings and strip personhood from them, it becomes very easy to convince the society in question that, that violence and against those people is perfectly acceptable if they're not persons. Now, you and I would probably never separate the term human from person. We would say that those are synonymous. If you're a human, you're a person. But when you can separate them and convince a society that there's such a thing as human non-persons, it becomes more intellectually tenable to be pro-choice. And this is what we do with unborn children. So our philosophical case for the value of the unborn child is very important because they will admit that it's a human but still say it's okay to kill that human. But when you say that human value is based on arbitrarily, randomly selected criteria, like skin color, and size, and level of development, and wantedness, and convenience, you dehumanize all human beings, because none of us share those capacities equally. So abortion ends up destroying human equality, because it says human value is not based on our human nature that we have in common. It's based on random capacities and functions that the power class gets to decide. That's what racists did, that's what Nazis did, and now that's what the pro-choice movement does to unborn children by denying them personhood. So I'm gonna show you how to make an argument for the equal value of the unborn child to you and I. That they have the same value as you and I. And we're gonna make a simple argument without citing Bible verses to make our case so that you're equipped to defend life to a culture that has no respect for the authority of scripture. But because all truth is God's truth, we're still defending God's truth. It goes like this. There's no meaningful difference between the embryonic human being that you once were and the adult that you are today that would justify killing you at that earlier stage. There's no meaningful difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that makes it okay to kill you, the embryo. Does that make sense? Now, are there differences between embryos and teenagers? Between embryos and grandpas? Yes, of course. And if I held up a four-week photo that your mother still has of you in utero, or eight weeks, or 12 weeks, 
and I held it up to you, you would look different. I'm not saying there's no differences between unborn people and born people. I'm saying that those differences do not matter to your right to life. Because your value is not found in those differences, it's found in your human nature. And guess what? Our human nature is the only thing we share equally. Because look around the room, you all differ, don't you? We all look different. We're not the same. So our value can't be found in our differences, it has to be found in what we have in common, which is a human nature. So what are the differences between unborn people and born people? Well, there's only four. And they're summarized in the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D. This is a very difficult concept for Southern Californians because we can't even spell the word snow, <laughs> but work with me. SLED. And guess what? These are the four differences that most pro-choice advocates will use to justify abortion. They'll say because the unborn differs from us in these ways, we can kill them. Let's see if those differences grant a right to life or not. Size. Yes, it's true the unborn child is smaller than the newborn child, but aren't newborn children smaller than toddlers? Aren't toddlers smaller than teenagers? Who here is under six foot three? Uh, you have less of a right to life than me because you're smaller than me. What a silly conclusion, right? And you laugh because you recognize the self-evident truth, friends, that human value is not based on size. But what do pro-choice individuals say about babies in the womb? Because the unborn child is smaller. I mean, come on, you can't even see the baby at four weeks. You said, you're saying that's a person with human rights? Dehumanizing unborn humans who are biologically human and justifying killing them simply because they're smaller. But if it would be wrong to kill you because you're smaller, it's equally wrong to kill unborn children simply because they're smaller. L stands for level of development. Yes, it's true, the unborn child is less developed than the newborn child. But aren't newborn children less developed than toddlers? Aren't toddlers less developed than teenagers? If you're older than 28, you're more developed than me because you're older. Do you have a greater right to life? How about your grandchildren? Are they have less value than you because they're less developed? Of course not, because human value is not based on our level of development. But what do pro-choice individuals say about unborn children? We can kill them because they don't feel pain, they don't have a heartbeat, they don't have brain waves that are detectable, and they're not viable. What does it take for an unborn child to realize those capacities? A level of development. They will reach that level of development eventually. So we dehumanize babies and justify killing them because they're not at the same level of development that we are, but that we used to be at. We used to be in the womb. We're unaborted. We came from wombs. We used to be at that same level of development. And now we say it's okay to kill other babies who are in the same position we once were. If it's wrong to kill born people because they're less developed than us, it's equally wrong to kill unborn people simply because they're less developed than us if they're human beings. And the science says that they are. Size, level of development. E stands for environment. E just means location, environment. Where are you? Yes, it's true. The unborn child is located in a very unique environment, correct? His or her mother's womb. By the way, it's where that baby's supposed to be. It's the most natural location for a human being to be at that level of development. Like I said, we all came from wombs. And sadly, friends, the womb has become the most dangerous place for a human being to reside in the United States of America. Estimates are that a third of Americans are missing. Where are they? They were aborted. They were ripped limb from limb. And we called it reproductive health care. But where one is has no bearing on who one is. The distance between us is a significantly further distance than the unborn child travels during childbirth. The unborn child moves six inches during childbirth through the birth canal. And our country says, you can rip them limb from limb as long as they're located in the womb. But once they're born, congratulations, human rights, baby. It's the magical birth canal, friends. It confers personhood. But where one is has no bearing on who one is. So if it would be wrong for me to kill you because you're over there, it's equally wrong to kill unborn children because they're located six inches away. Size, level of development, environment, and dependency. This is arguably the most important one, because at this point, a pro-choice individual would probably tell me, fine, Seth, value does not come from size, level of development, or location, but the baby's dependent on the mother. The baby can't survive apart from the mother, so it's her prerogative and choice whether she's going to get an abortion or not. All righty, let's examine that. Yes, it's true, the unborn child is dependent on the mother. And in the first trimester and early second trimester, the unborn child can't survive apart from the mother, correct? Now, 
medical technology and scientific advancements are enabling us to save prematurely born babies earlier and earlier and earlier, which means that we can make them independent, not dependent on their mother, earlier and earlier and earlier. Now, why is this interesting? Because many pro-choice individuals say, OK, I will agree that abortion is wrong once the baby can survive outside the womb. Once the baby's not dependent on the mother, then I'll, then I'll agree with you, pro-lifer, that abortion's wrong. But medical technology is enabling us to make unborn children survive apart from their mother at earlier and earlier stages of development. So are you saying that a right to life constantly shifts and changes based off of medical advancements? How could human rights be tied to medical advancements? Because it's not. Because human value is not based on your dependency on someone or something else. If it is, then we'd be forced to concede that born people like us who are dependent on heart pacemakers, kidney machines, insulin, and life support can all be slaughtered because they're dependent on something without which they cannot continue to live. Anyone like where that reasoning leads? Do you see how the pro-choice argument destroys human equality? Because the arguments offered in defense of abortion can equally be offered in defense of killing born people. Because if human value is tied to size, level of development, environment, and dependency, well, all born people don't share those capacities equally. If you consistently apply pro-choice pro ideology, it justifies the killing of born people who don't meet the criteria that you've said human beings need to meet to have value. This is very dangerous. Dangerous namely because it's led to the death of over 60 million babies in America since 1973, and also because it destroys human equality for all of us. So there's no meaningful difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that makes it okay to kill you, the embryo. And the only differences between unborn people and born people are size, level of development, environment, and dependency. So the unborn child differs from us in much the same way that we differ from one another, namely, uh, namely according to size, level of development, environment, and dependency. So what is the unborn? They're a human being, the science has spoken. Theologically, they're image bearers of God. And therefore, if you are a Christian who wants to follow Jesus, you cannot remain pro-choice. You can be a Christian and be pro-choice, but if you care about following Jesus and being discipled and looking more like him, you cannot remain pro-choice because the Bible says that unborn children are image bearers of God. And lastly, we offer a philosophical case for the value of unborn life by pointing out that the only differences between unborn people and born people are the same differences between all born people. This is who the unborn is. They are a neighbor, they are an image bearer of God, and they are a human being. So that's how we defend life. Now, practically, what does it look like to love our unborn neighbors? We love them by defending them. We love them by being a voice. We love them by Proverbs 31.8 doing speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. But how do we be the hands and feet of Jesus? How do we practically love our unborn neighbors for whom it is currently legal to kill through all nine months of pregnancy and in which every Democratic presidential candidate running for president supports abortion to the day of birth? Now, if that angers you, please come talk to me afterwards, because I'm not here to preach a political sermon. But I am here to make sure you know what's going on in the country. What's going on in the country is that every Democratic presidential candidate running for the Democratic presidential ticket supports abortion to the day of birth, except one. And she just draws the line at second trimester, which doesn't make any sense, at third trimester, rather. It's like saying, you can kill Timmy when he's two, but not when he's one. If it's wrong to kill humans, it's wrong to kill them at all levels of development. So there is a war against unborn children. Again, I'm not, please don't give me, I'm not saying Jesus is a Republican. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> no, really, I, I'm not here to tell you that to be a Christian, you have to be Republican. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that to defend life, we have to defend all life. And there's only one political party that wants to kill babies for the day of birth. So we need to know what's going on. Why? Because we've been called to defend life. We've been called to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So, how, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. I want you to be equipped to do that because so many of you are passionately pro-life. I know it, but you've sometimes felt like you, you're not equipped, like you haven't had the tools and resources to engage on the battlefield of abortion. So here's how we can defend life, and now here's how we can love our unborn neighbors. Firstly, we need to love our unborn neighbors by acknowledging together, friends, that the unborn is our neighbor. 
this seems self-evident now because I just made a case for the unborn being our neighbor, but many of us haven't really thought about the unborn as a neighbor before. For most of my life, when I read the verse, love your neighbor as yourself, I didn't think of unborn children because why? We don't see them as much, do we? It's easy to see our homeless neighbors, right? It's easy to see our neighbors who are suffering because they're born. We see them with our eyes, but we often don't see our unborn neighbors. So we need to acknowledge together that the unborn is our neighbor. And one of the most important ways to do that, friends, is by seeing them. It's by looking at them. And it's also by seeing what abortion does to them. So we're going to give you an opportunity this morning, friends, to see what abortion is and does to our unborn neighbors. This is a short 55-second video clip that is graphic and disturbing. And the reason it's graphic and disturbing, friends, is guess what? Abortion is graphic and disturbing. This is not pro-life propaganda created to elicit an emotional response. This is the reality. This is what God sees 3,000 times a day in a country that was supposed to be founded on the idea of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You don't get those if you're dismembered. You have no liberty or pursuit of happiness if you have no right to life. Just as we were shown Holocaust imagery and slavery imagery in school as students because we needed to recognize what happened and not repeat it, so too do we need to look at the victims of abortion who are our neighbors. I want to warn you beforehand that the video is graphic and disturbing, and so if you would like to opt out of the presentation, you have the complete freedom to do so. If you have high school students you want to step out of the room, feel free to do that. We're not manipulating or tricking anyone into watching this, okay? There is instrumental music over the clip, so if you choose to close your eyes and look down at your feet, you won't even hear anything you don't want to hear. <laughs> and by the time the music stops, you can open your eyes and you won't have seen anything you wouldn't have wanted to see. But we're going to give you the opportunity. So without any further ado, let's play this short video clip. My dear friends, never forget that every single one of those abortions was legal. I know we have a more visceral reaction to third trimester abortions because it looks more like what we think a baby should look like, but the reality is that those were all babies that looked exactly how a baby's supposed to look at that level of development. With the exception of that final clip, friends, those were all babies in the first trimester. That's the trimester in which there's the most public support for abortion. It's the trimester in which over 90% of abortions are performed, and it's the trimester in which there's been the most lies. It's just a blob of tissue. It's just a potential person. It's just a clump of cells. This is what God sees 3,000 times a day. While there have been 60 million abortions in our country since 1973, there are 50 million abortions a year worldwide. Friends, this makes Hitler and Stalin look like toddlers playing in a sandbox. And those are some of the darkest moments in human history. We don't show you this imagery to shame you or condemn you, friends. If you've had an abortion, or if you're a man and you've pressured, paid for, or stood by and done nothing, we don't show you this to condemn you. In fact, I believe that if Jesus were here bodily, he would tell you that he's just as eager to welcome you into his arms and forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. Abortion's not a blacklist sin. Abortion doesn't ban you from the grace of God. You want an example of this? King David had a pretty big speed bump in his spiritual journey, didn't he? He's hanging out on his roof rather than fighting on the front lines with his army and he sees a woman taking a shower. 
And he decides he would like to enjoy her more than visually. So he brings her into his room. They have sexual intercourse. A baby is conceived from that union. And now David goes, oh, shoot. Now I need to arrange the death of an innocent human being to hide and cover up my sexual sin. Friends, what is abortion but the arranging of the death of an innocent human being? And whether it's done to hide or cover up sexual sin or not, it doesn't really matter because the end result is the same, right? A dead, innocent human being. But was that the end of David's story? Well, no, the, Nathan, the prophet Nathan knew exactly what David did. And he confronted David on his sin. And David repents and falls to his knees and asks for forgiveness from the Lord. And God renews him and faithful and just to forgive him and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. Calls him a man after his own heart. But there were consequences to David's sin. His son died. His baby died. A little baby. And he said regarding his baby, he said, my son will not return to me. But I will go to him. I will see him. What that means for you who have been involved with an abortion, it means that not only is Jesus faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you merely repent, but it means that your little baby is seated on the lap of Jesus waiting to welcome you into glory with a hug and a kiss. Jesus is just as eager to forgive the sin of abortion as any other sin. And if you have not healed from an abortion, I would encourage you to seek out Teresa afterwards or seek out one of your pastors and begin that journey. Because Jesus wants to make beauty from your ashes, friends. And he wants to use you to help where you used to hurt by being a voice for our unborn neighbors. There are more people working full-time to kill babies than there are working full-time to save them. We need you. If this is part of your story, I encourage you to begin a journey of healing with the Lord and then be used to help where you used to hurt. So if we're going to love our unborn neighbors, friends, we have to acknowledge that they are our neighbor. And we need to rethink them as neighbors. Secondly, we have to repent for not being a good neighbor. Because it always begins with repentance, doesn't it? It's where the gospel begins. We have all failed to love our unborn neighbors. I have failed to love my unborn neighbor the way that the law of God commands. So we need to repent together to the Lord for not being a good neighbor. Whether you've had an abortion, paid for it, pressured it, ignored it, treated it as a woman's right issue, treated it as feminism, or treated it as a non-issue, We've all failed to love our unborn neighbor well. But there's a beautiful promise in Scripture for those of us who repent. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Friends, does our land need healing? So we need to repent for not being good neighbors. Lastly, we need to respond with words and with deeds. Because true faith evidence itself in works. We need to respond with words and with deeds on the greatest human rights violation in human history. We need to respond with words by learning how to defend life. By learning how to communicate our pro-life position and love to a post-Christian secular society that doesn't share our Christian worldview. And I'm here to help you do that. If you would tear off the Connect card that you were given this morning, you can fill this out and drop it in a little basket on the way out at the gazebo. And you'll be added to my newsletter list and get my podcast and get resources and training and videos and articles on how to defend life. You need to equip yourself to enter the battlefield of abortion. We're fools if we run out onto a spiritual battlefield as dark as abortion without any weapons or armor or defense. So I'm here to help you do that. We need to respond with words because 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts, honor the Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. If we need to be prepared to defend the gospel, we also need to be prepared to defend how the gospel informs how we view certain issues like abortion. We need to be equipped to defend life. And we need to respond with deeds. And I have four simple steps here for you as individuals and you as a church to respond with deeds on the issue of abortion. Firstly, create a culture of acceptance and not shame. May it be true of this church and in fact all of the Bible-believing churches in Southern California that when a woman is facing an unplanned pregnancy, her first thought is not, I need to run to Planned Parenthood and get rid of the evidence of my sin. Get rid of the evidence of my premarital sex. May her first response be, I can tell my pastor and my community and they will love and accept me. That doesn't mean that they celebrate the sin. It means they celebrate and love you and want to help you choose life. 
So create a culture of acceptance and not shame. Secondly, offer to pay the bills if necessary to help women in unplanned pregnancies. Many women choose abortion because they feel like they can't afford to have another child or a child at all. Now, is financial struggles a justification for abortion? No, just as it wouldn't be okay to kill your toddlers because they're too expensive. But it does mean that the church has a role to play in being the hands and feet of Jesus and giving generously to help women choose life, men and women to choose life. So advertise your church's willingness to do that. Put an ad in the newspaper. Tell the Pregnancy Resource Center to run an ad in their newsletter that you're willing to pay for any other cost that a woman would need in order to feel confident in choosing life. And do that on an individual basis, too. Thirdly, advertise the church's willingness to adopt and raise any child. If a mere 50%, 60% of Christian families in our country adopted one child, orphanages would cease to exist. But we don't, because it's often inconvenient and difficult to love neighbors. So advertise your willingness and this church's willingness to adopt and raise any child. Get a list of families in this church that would advertise there are X number of families at this church who would adopt your child if you would merely choose life, if you would merely carry to term. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. And lastly, support pro-life organizations and your local pregnancy resource center. This is a very pro-life church that already supports the local pregnancy resource center, praise God. You need to do that on an individual basis, friends. When there are only a handful of ministries in a given city that are standing on the front lines in the ditches where women choose life or choose death, we need to be funding those organizations and helping them save life. We all have a role to play to end the slaughter of children, especially when that slaughter is legal. And support other pro-life organizations. There are wonderful organizations fighting on the university front, the political front, the spiritual front to help end abortion. If you're interested in what I do, speaking to young people, speaking to pastors, speaking to Christian leaders, and speaking on secular university campuses, and you can partner with me by filling out the Connect card as well. So these are the deeds that we can do to love our unborn neighbors and their mothers and fathers. So friends, all of this, all of this leads us to the question that the parable of the Good Samaritan finishes with. (laughs) What type of people are we going to be? Are we going to be like the Levite and the priest who know the law of God, who know that babies are being killed, who know that there are bleeding victims on the side of the road, on the corner, at this Planned Parenthood, at this Planned Parenthood, and we walk by and we pretend like we don't see them because, gosh, it's difficult and inconvenient and uncomfortable to stand out and speak out and defend those neighbors. Or are we going to be like the lawyer who challenges Jesus and like, oh, these people are neighbors and these people are non-neighbors, and since these people are non-neighbors, I don't have to love them. Are we going to create classes of human beings that we get to love and not love? Or are we going to be like the good Samaritan who made radical sacrifices to love his neighbor? So I want you to hear the final words in the parable of the good Samaritan, friends. And rather than picturing the man who got beat up on the road, I want you to picture the unborn bleeding victims. I want you to picture the little babies you saw on that screen. Because they are our bleeding victims. And hear the final words of Jesus in the parable of the good Samaritan. Jesus asked the lawyer... Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the bleeding victim? Who was a neighbor to the man bleeding, needing help? And he told Jesus, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. 